Well, thank you, uh, Senator Carper. Professor Ghani, um, a couple of questions. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. You've been, all of you have been great, uh, but we're going to start to wrap this up with just a few more questions. Um, Mr. Ghani, um, what, what do you see as the central provisions of uh, contracts involving AI systems that governments are not currently incorporating and should be required? Um, I, I think simply what the, the majority of the procurement process I've seen it over focuses on the mechanics of the system being procured. And so I'll give you an example. Um, many years ago I was working with police departments on these systems called early intervention systems that were designed to uh, identify police officers who were going to use unjustified force and, and shootings and detect them early. When you look at procurement documents, RFPs for systems, what they talked about was measuring how, what is the uptime of the system? Can people log into the system? Does it show up as opposed to the truly functional requirements, which are does it reduce police shootings? Does it prevent those shootings? Does it help save people's lives? So they, what, what's happening is that the focus has been on the mechanics because it's easy to do. It's easy to measure. It doesn't require that much thinking and effort. Um, and so we do the easy thing and we forget the hard stuff. There are many such other examples where we've got contracts that we get stuck into that are unnecessarily long-term. Um, we don't allow the systems to get data out and put more data in. Um, we don't have them interoperate because as we talked about, AI systems don't work in isolation. They're connected to different pieces. Um, there's a lack of, of customization and configuration. Um, and and I think that there's a whole series of things. So what we need to do is create a much more holistic procurement process that has both requirements around what did you design the system to do? How did you do it so that it, how did you validate that it did what you wanted it to do? And how are you developing a continuous monitoring process that's continuing to do so? Um, and, and most of those things, there are no standards that exist today for that procurement and we need to create those. So a follow up on that. Uh, maybe and other you, others were nodding their heads. This is important. So what the what those requirements are? Then the other question is, can we standardize those requirements across a variety of government agencies, or does it have to be uh, more or more niche? Do you want to take the first stab at that? Then I see uh, Ms. Raj, you're nodding your head too. So your thoughts uh, on that, and any others that want to jump in? But uh, Mr. Ghani, I think it's going to have to be an eighty twenty thing here, where there's a series of things that we can standardize. And what we can standardize on is what do we ask for? Um, we can standardize, we need, we need to figure out what value the system is built on. We need to figure out how you built it. What design choices did you build? What artifacts were produced? Does it work for people? How, who does it work for? Who does it not work for? How was it validated? Those are kind of high level questions that we can standardize that need to be there. Data in, data out, interoperability, configuration. What we cannot standardize on is what specific values it should have. That needs to come from the use case rate. Right? So, and that's where that collaboration is going to happen is people with expertise in understanding the policy issue. And, you know, we're talking about service delivery. What is the goal of that service? Is it to improve people's lives or is it to save money? When there's a trade off, who decides that? Those the questions that we were talking about earlier. Those are the things that are not going to be standard. They're going to depend on the specific use case and specific policy and the specific service. But Everything, the process that was used to design that system to come up with those values and, and to validate it and, and all the other things, those can be standardized. So again, it's, I think it's going to be an 80-20 thing where 80% can be standardized and 20% will need to be, be customized. Great. And if anyone else has thoughts, but uh, Ms. Raja, you have some thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Senator Peters, for your question. Um, so at a, at a high level, I think we could also think about it from the other way, which is what data is available for AI to tackle from a low-hanging fruit perspective, right? So I think there's a way to uh, organize, hey, this is the data that's available that potentially can be used for automation. This is the level of um, kind of the responsible AI that can be applied to these particular questions. And so perhaps getting AI slowly integrated via this is the data available and the, this, these are the questions that um, there are more guardrails around that could be a good way to start the standardization process. 
because um, starting standards without actually tying it to specific use cases and mission need, um, then you'll have that misalignment. Mr. Roberts. Yes, Senator, I'll, I'll piggyback on something Professor Ghani said too about uh, obsessing over the mechanics in terms of valuing the performance. Uh, this is why it's so important for acquisition professionals to be mission focused and look at AI as an enhancement of the mission because it is so easy to, as Professor Ghani mentioned, uh, to measure performance based on mechanics, based on how is it working rather than is it working? Is it actually valuable to the end user? When you have a focus on that, I think you find that the acquisition team changes the way they approach even risks and responsible use of AI. They change the way they uh, look at the intellectual property. It all focuses on mission value and value to end user, which trickles down into the way we, we look at everything. Mr. Ghani, uh, back to you. Um, we've heard uh, previously about the need to audit uh, AI systems uh, to account for uh, drift and uh, unintended uh, consequences. My question for you is what procedures should be put in place to audit the government and uh, are these AI systems within the government? And should this need be accounted for up front in the uh, procurement process? And if so, how? If so, absolutely, yes. It, it, I, think, I think the audit has to be there. Um, and. And I think there are, in my mind, there, there are three, three stages of this, this audit, right? The, the first audit, and I think I keep going back to it, and we're all sort of saying the same word, values, right? When we're designing a system, the procurement has to ask for a system to help achieve certain values. We need to audit those and validate whether those are the values we actually care about. That's the first audit. That's not a technical audit. That's a values audit. Number two is when a system is being procured, we need to audit whether it was how did the, 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 the vendor, consultant, researcher build this system to help it achieve those values. So that's a technical audit. Three, once it's deployed, it's not going to work in isolation. In most cases, it is informing, especially high stakes decisions, it's informing humans. And so you can audit the system for what it outputs, but we need to audit how does it interact with this person and how does this human decisions change? Because that's eventually what we care about is, is impact on, on people. So we need to audit the interaction between the, the AI system and the human system um, and then audit the outcomes that it produces. So those are the four pieces and it's not a one-off. It's a continuous thing because it's going to change. Mr. Roberts, uh, how can the government ensure that the data that's used for testing and training uh, the government's AI platforms is actually secure and protected? And anyone else can jump in on these too, so, uh, but I'll, I'll pick out one individual, but feel free if you want to say anything to raise your hand as we wrap up. Only a couple more questions and then you'll be free. Mr. Roberts. Yes, Senator, I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, the more we restrict the free flow of data and access uh, to, uh, from contractors to the data, there's also uh, a sense in which that becomes more problematic as well, especially for the functioning of the model. So we've seen instances just on the other side of over-classification, over-regulation, uh, over-protection of data that has killed projects. <clears throat> However, having said that, data security, protection, and privacy it's essential, especially in, in areas that I've worked with, with the classified data that affects national security and personally identifiable information, especially with health records. We've, we've seen some things that have helped, especially with health records. Uh, the use of synthetic data was beneficial to us uh, that we were able to use. So there's other sources of data. Uh, but not to oversimplify, I think that the most important thing for the acquisition field is to put the ethics uh, professional, the person who is dealing with privacy, the security professional, into the planning phase. Again, having a balanced team that has all these professionals involved at the very beginning. Supply chain risk is another big problem uh, with security. It's something that's not looked at much. And what we're finding with AI is a lot of these rules, such as supply chain risk, uh, were always rules, but we're, they're re-emerging in much more important ways when we're looking at AI. The, the risks, the adversarial threats. So it's looking at all these risks in new ways and it's making sure you have a full balanced team to be with you at the planning stage on how to deal with it. Right. Ms. Raj? Yeah, I want to talk about it from the perspective of small business. Um, Crowd AI has worked with the U.S. government on AI initiatives on a wide range of sensors, all unclassified. Um, as we move forward and mature, you know, 
we started working with more of the, you know, with DCSA to make sure that we could be ready for other types of data, more sensitive data. Um, many systems that we worked with, with US government data, were either on bare metal servers or data that remained in government clouds. So I believe that it is important that if a company that's in dual use wants to work with the US government, they also need to ensure that the data is treated with responsibility and privacy to the maximum extent possible. I think that as companies start putting their, dual their, their technology in a more dual use manner, they also need to comply with privacy and regulation that is so standard across a lot of large companies. Um, and you know, AI is an ever evolving technology and so the way you um, make sure that companies of all sizes continue this type of evaluation around privacy and ethics is making sure that there's qualitative and quantitative testing because often aggregated statistics may not paint the full picture. Very good. Well, I would uh, like to thank our witnesses uh, for being uh, here today. Uh, I'm certainly grateful to your uh, contributions. This is a very important discussion, and it doesn't end here. Uh, we're going to have uh, many more discussions going forward. We hope all of you are available to uh, help this committee uh, work on this uh, important uh, issue. Certainly, as we heard today, the, uh, the use of automated systems to help the government provide public uh, uh, services uh, more efficiently is nothing new. Uh, we've been dealing with this uh, for a long time. Mr. Roberts, you've been dealing with it for a long time, as well as everybody on the panel. However, as we enter this age of rapid development of advanced machine learning models and, and other forms of artificial intelligence uh, now, uh, is the time to ensure that the uh, algorithmic systems of the government uh, buys do not have unintended uh, or harmful uh, consequences. And I think as each of our witnesses have, have emphasized, uh, enacting appropriate guardrails and oversight policies for the procurement of uh, AI in government will shape its development and use across uh, all industry and industries in the years to come. Americans deserve a government that is modern, that is efficient and innovative, as well as one that is transparent, fair, trustworthy, and protects their privacy. And as chairman of this committee, I'll continue to work to ensure that uh, government lives up to these principles uh, and that promise. Uh, your testimony will help inform the committee's future and legislative activities uh, going forward. And again, we hope this is an ongoing dialogue uh, in a very uh, fast-moving and uh, challenging area, but essential uh, for us uh, to understand and, and act appropriately. The, uh, the record uh, for this hearing will remain open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on September 29th of 2023 for the submission of statements and questions uh, for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.